Let's take this opportunity to bring in a special guest, uh, Dr. Eric First, the uh, principal investigator for the investigation known as In Space 3, or Investigating the Structure of Paramagnetic Aggregates from Colloidal Emulsions. He's coming to us live from his lab at the University of Delaware. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. Thanks. Well, say, let's start off with a real simple question. What is this experiment you're working on? Sure. The, uh, the experiment is uh, looking at fluids that we call magnetorheological fluids. And uh, these are um, uh, fluid materials that are composed of little tiny particles. They're about a micrometer in dimension suspended in water. Um, that micron, if you, if, you, if you think about the dimension or the diameter of a human hair, that's about one one hundredth of the size of a human hair. Uh, and these particles, when they, they normally they float around and the whole material uh, behaves like a fluid, uh, but when you apply a magnetic field to those samples, those little, little particles act like magnets and they start to line up and they assemble with one another. And if you looked at this fluid, uh, what we call the rheology of the material, how it flows, uh, when you apply that field, it goes from a liquid to a solid very suddenly. Uh, and so we're investigating with these experiments some of the underlying phenomena, uh, some, of the, some of the details of how those particles come together uh, and assemble into those structures and how we can control that. You know, right now we're looking at some recorded video of what we've uh, affectionately dubbed the green blob here in Mission Control. Uh, and I know what you, you know what this looks like because you've been watching the results of your experiment. Can you explain a little bit what we're looking at here? Sure, absolutely. So it doesn't look like much, but it's actually pretty exciting for us. These are, the, the black regions are the particles, and, and so those are, the dimensions there are several hundred microns. They're about the size of a human hair, so we're not seeing the individual particles. But what we're seeing is how they come together and aggregate in the presence of pulsed magnetic fields. Uh, the green that you're mentioning is just the light passing through our sample, so that's what allows us to distinguish uh, the assembled structure from just the surrounding fluid. Um, we monitor that structure. We look at how it evolves with time, uh, especially as we toggle the field on and off. Uh, and we characterize the growth of those structures and how they develop. And that's, that's giving us insight into um, not only the, the fluid properties that, of, of these materials, but giving us some sense of how tiny particles come together and, and do what we call self-assemble or build greater structures uh, from themselves. Um, so specifically, what kind of activities do, is go, are going on within space this week, and, and how does the crew help you set up the experiment? Oh, I mean, the, 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 the experiments that we're doing, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a number of our uh, test run experiments. Um, we have a, 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 about 40 experiments that we, ru that we run through to test a matrix of uh, field strength, different conditions, field strength, field frequency, uh, and suspension concentration. And, and actually, these particles are tiny particles that have, they're, they're like little ellipsoids or a little rice grain-like particles in shape. If you, if you were to look at them under a microscope, they would, they would have that sort of uh, uh, shape to them. Um, we, we have actually made a couple different types of particles that have different lengths. Uh, and so we're, we're looking at experiments that ask, uh, you know, how does particle shape affect these processes as well? Uh, so the astronauts take our samples. I don't know if you have an image of those. I mean, it's a simple vial. The fluids dispersed in that vial. They were sent up, I think, on, oh, I want to say the Discovery on the second to last launch, or maybe it was the Endeavor. Uh, about two years ago. Uh, they've been up there, and the astronauts take those samples. They uh, integrate them into our experiment, which is in the microgravity sciences glove box. Uh, and, you know, it's rule film at that point. They, they have to they, they set up the entire experiment, capture it on video. We get the downlink data. We monitor it in real time. And the key thing is that they record it on DV video, uh, and that's sent back eventually so that we can, we can take that very high-quality data and analyze it for our uh, research results. Okay. Well, how does doing this experiment on the space station as opposed to on Earth make it possible? Oh, well, these particles are heavy. Uh, and so if you were to do this experiment on the Earth, which we do, we do, we do experiments with these materials, um, but the, the, the limit is that they just fall out of suspension. So they'll, they'll rapidly what we call uh, a sediment, right? So uh, instead of being fluid and, and mobile and moving around, uh, they just fall out. Now, we can do experiments, and it's sort of like 2D experiments because they end up making sort of pancake-like structures on the bottom of our 
uh, our sample vials, and we can look at that with microscopy. But the key with microgravity is, you know, I eliminate that whole effect of, of having them sediment out. And so um, that makes the results that we have here much more generalizable in the sense that what we see and how particles assemble and the structures that they form, we feel that that can translate to particles of all different sizes. And what we're especially interested in is particles that are really small, nanoparticles, that we can't necessarily do experiments easily like this with anywhere. Um, we're getting some insight into how nanoparticles assemble by doing these experiments. And from that, we're trying to figure out basically how we can take tiny particles and build bigger structures from that. That gets back to that kind of self-assembly idea uh, that we're talking about. We, we think that that's going to give us new technologies, new ways of manufacturing based on the idea of taking little building blocks, these little particles, and having them come together, self-assemble into bigger functional structures. So in a way, is this kind of like the uh, old Star Trek Next Generation concept of nanobots? Oh, I don't know. You'll have to fill me in on that. I can't remember the nanobot stuff. Um, uh, and, you know, probably it, I dream of that. Um, it, in some ways, uh, the materials that we're trying to enable of, uh, may seem more mundane. They may be thermal barriers. They may be materials that enable uh, 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 better, better utility of uh, the solar power. Um, you know, those... One of the things that we've learned in nanotechnology is how to build structures um, that are really tailored uh, to, to transport light or to transport energy. Um, the question that we have is, can we have those types of structures build themselves, basically, self-assemble? But they're not, they're not self-assembling in, in a sort of intelligent way, right, it, it, as a nanobot might, I guess, to form a bigger organism. Um, it's, it's, a little, it's a little less organized than that. Okay, uh, and uh, these colloids, uh, let's try to relate them to something that folks on the ground would recognize. Uh, some things are, are like paint where you have to stir it so off, every so often to keep the paint particles into the liquid systems. Is that right? Uh, that's right. I mean, and actually, uh, the colloid sort of refers to a specific length scale of matter, and that, that goes back to that that, that the idea that these particles are on the order of about a micrometer. A colloid is, is usually a, it's a, it's a division of matter. It's a piece of matter that's anywhere from about 10 nanometers uh, to several micrometers. So the, the micron range is a, bit, a little bit larger size scale. What that, why that length scale is um, uh, 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 unique is that it, it confers on these particles the ability to move around by Brownian motion. All right, and 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 that that kind of gives the, the the systems this ability to self-assemble. But if you go back to where where people have seen colloids, you see it every day. Milk is a colloid, basically. It's a it's a dispersion of fat droplets in water, and that's why it's so opaque. All those little droplets are scattering light, um, and clearly they don't sediment out or they don't cream, right? Uh, so they're they're moving around by Brownian motion in that fluid. Many of the consumer products that we use, and, and like you mentioned, paints uh, and things like that, many foods have some aspect of being colloidal. And so it's a, it's a, it's a lane scale matter we use every day of our lives, but we often don't recognize that. And, uh, and you know, it's a really, uh, if you get into food and you get excited about those types of things, you'll find yourself actually working in this whole field of colloid science. And, and you know, from there you can do many things. You can control how fluids flow. You can, uh, you know, try to make these self-assembling structures. It's really quite exciting. Well, how might you apply this for the benefit of folks on the Earth? Well, like I said, the, the whole question of how we get particles to come together and sort of form structures, this idea of self-assembly, right, that's really what we, what, what we really are trying to get insight into. And if you go back to the problem of, of fabricating um, nanomaterials or nanodevices, right, I mean, we know that we can make nanodevices like uh, what we have today in microprocessors from this, you know, sort of what we refer to as a top-down method where we, you know, add materials, we subtract materials, we build up the structure to a pretty laborious, you know, batch operation with many, many steps. Um, you know, that's, that's great. That gives us these functional devices that are super sophisticated. And, and, and those devices, those structures, you know, they move charge around and, and they can do computations with that. Um, what we're looking for is 
a, me- a method of manufacturing where we could it, where it would be scalable, where we could do large areas in a continuous uh, process. Um, so very fast, very rapid. You know, you're not going to make microprocessors with this, but you might make your new photovoltaic device out of it, or or, or photovoltaic material, or your new thermal barrier. Uh, you know, for an application, I can imagine that would be a nice space application in some cases. So. Ultimately, this is really going to benefit people on Earth because it gives us this insight into making and fabricating new materials and, 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 and essentially coming up with new manufacturing processes that harness nanotechnology. Well, thanks. Uh, hey, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? Where did you go to school? Uh, well, I, uh, I did my undergraduate degree at Carnegie Mellon, and uh, that's not too far from where I grew up. I grew up in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, in western Pennsylvania. And uh, I did my uh, graduate work after uh, being at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I did my graduate work at Stanford University under, uh, the, uh, uh, under an advisor, Alice Gast. Uh, and uh, after that, I did a postdoc in France, uh, working a little bit in biophysics, so another area that's influenced by colloid science. And I've been here at the University of Delaware now for almost 12 years. Um, all, my entire education has been in chemical engineering, but you can see uh, that background really bridges all sorts of areas from the physical sciences to chemistry. So it's been a really rich and rewarding uh, trajectory. And, and how big is your team there at the University of Delaware? I have uh, about seven PhD students. Sorry, that's not an approximate number. There, I actually have seven PhD students and uh, two postdocs working with me directly. Usually we have a couple undergraduate graduates in the lab. And uh, I have one or two high school students working with us as well. So it's a team of, you know, fluctuates between about 12 and 14 people, all different stages in their education, doing work in the lab and helping us out uh, in all the experiments and, 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 and all the discovery of knowledge that comes with that. Well, Dr. Eric First from the University of Delaware, I want to thank you once again for being with us and explaining this uh, very interesting experiment that uh, has potential applications in so many areas of our lives. We really appreciate your being here today. Thanks, Kelly. It was a real pleasure.